Hi guys, um, welcome to In The Know, this is our first podcast and today we're joined by all round legend and Winchingham Fields owner, Colin McGurin. Welcome to the new studio, Colin. Hey. <laughs> great studio guys, look doing well, doing good. Yeah, cheers, thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's great to, to finally have you here, we've been talking about getting you in the studio for ages now. Um, well, it's good to tell the story. If we start off, obviously, um, Wintering of Fields and everything's been a great success. So do you want to tell us? Yeah, Wintering of Fields, it, it has been, um, it's been a, a success for, for many, many years, um, even before me. So for anyone who knows Wintering of Fields, it was probably one of the best restaurants in the UK uh, and well-renowned, you know, in, in Europe as well. And then in 2005, I, I bought it with no real experience of um, running a restaurant. So... You know, it needs some balls of steel or just naivety to buy something like that. But it's, uh, I think it's regra- it regained a lot of its reputation and accolades and uh, we're very proud of it. So what was your experience before that, Colin? Well, uh, you know, I'd always liked cooking as a kid, you know, and I used to kind of cook with my grandma. I know it sounds a bit of a cliche, you know, shedding peas in front of a fire, but it, that's what it was. You know, my nana used to defrost the chicken in front of a fire and God, health and safety in them days weren't an issue. But uh, I used to do lots of lots of you know pie making and 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 just love the idea of of cooking. And what I really noticed is that when my grandmother cooked for all of us, she never ate with us, right? She'd just watch us eat, and we're going, oh, this is these Yorkshire puddings are great, and this pie is amazing. And she was just beaming with joy, and that sense of joy came from just us enjoying the food. And that's that's something that cooking does where you cook and you watch someone's face light up with delight and you get that reward and it's instant there's not many businesses out there where you get instant gratification from doing something that you really love and I really took that away and I thought god that's amazing I think I want to be a cook because I want to make people happy straight away um but I didn't know how to cook really so I started uh, I went to I went to um cooking school at the age of uh, 16 17 and was that it, in the UK? Or? I was in Bournemouth, yeah, in Bournemouth. Because I know you was, was it Zambia? You was yeah, I was born, born in Zambia, grew up in, in Abu Dhabi, and uh, and the rest of the kind of teens was in, in, in Lancashire, of all places, in Morecambe. Um, but uh, yeah, I went to school, uh, catering college in Bournemouth, and then in my first year out, they sent me to a two mission star in the Loire Valley, south of Paris. I thought, wow, I'll do that, yeah. <laughs> and it was the worst experience of my life. You know, I used to go home and cry my eyes out every day because it was just brutal. It was the classic French bullying culture, cooking, throwing hot pans at you and, th- you know, speaking to you, swearing at you in French, even though I didn't know what they were saying, but I just knew it wasn't very good. And I always swore if I had my own restaurant, it wouldn't be like that. In fact, it nearly killed me. I, th- I thought, you know what? I don't, want, I don't want to be in this industry if it's going to be like this. Not knowing any better, I thought, well, if this, this must be how it is. To get high accolades, you need to be an absolute shit. And actually, you don't. You know, you just got to be a leader. But anyway, so I, I continued to, um, to, to do other things, um, you know, and, and push myself to work in other places. I'd say, look, I'd work for free. If you could uh, give me food and, and accommodation, I'll work for free. And working in a two mission star place in France, it was great. Um, and then I just kept doing that. And there's not many places who would accept you. But I mean, I, feel, I can remember writing my CV out, which consisted of my name and address. And you know, I think it worked in a coffee shop when I was 14. Um, and I just went through a guidebook and picked all the top restaurants of the world. And I say, right, I work for free. And they got back to you. Only about 10 got back to me. And I said, right, I'll go, I'll go there. And I got this experience. And then before you know it, a couple of years later, my CV's got all the best places in the world on, you know. And I, I, I would be working in Abu Dhabi, working for five-star hotels in, in the Middle East, uh, working for royal families, working for, uh, you know, big five-star hotels with, with real good quality. So then I'd saved a bit of cash. And um, it was a time where banks in the UK were giving you 100% mortgages and things like that. They were, they were giving 105% mortgages, you know. So I came back to the UK with a, a handful of cash and I bought, I wanted to find a, a place in the UK that I could, you know, have my own business. And uh, although my parents were in Bournemouth, I just had to travel around the UK to find somewhere that I could afford. And uh, I found a place in Yorkshire, in, in Dewsbury. I bought this pub for 
next to nothing really. And uh, I learned how to, I cut my teeth on, on learning how to run a business then, you know, how to change the fuses and how to pay people and, and what's PYE and what tax, what's that, you know? Um, and you learn all of that, it, apart from just looking after the customers and cooking was, 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 was what, what I really learned. And then I sold that to a brewery uh, and how house prices were going through the roof at that time. So I, I caught a lucky, Lucky, uh, lucky um, escape on them. Then I bought this hotel called the Stone Lee Hotel. Whereabouts was that? In Wakefield. It turned out to be faulty towers. I mean, a car crash of a building. Uh, I thought I could, I could put my influences of the United Arab Emirates into Wakefield. <laughs> and I thought, if they do it, if I cook it right, people will come. Yeah, yeah. Oh my God, people were smashing each other with fire extinguishers, fighting, throwing up on the tables, blaming me because it's the quality of my cheap wine. I think, oh my God, what have I done? So I thought I'd maybe put the price up a bit to kind of get rid of the riffraff, but it just, <laughs> I was charging 9.95 for a three course Sunday lunch and people were going, whoa, you're robbing it, you know, it's too wow. expensive. I'm thinking, what? Anyway, so it went down the pan. All the money I'd made till then, yeah. I was, I was going to lose it all. And I can remember the bank coming, you know, meeting one morning and saying, Colin, do you know what, mate? We're going to be taking this business off you soon. I'm like, are you kidding me? You know, all since I was 16, worked, 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 you know, to the bone and to save all this money. And I thought I was, you know, doing really well business wise, buying and selling pubs and stuff like that. And here it is. It's coming to the end. And I had I was in my overdraft. I had 200 pounds left in my overdraft. So I thought, right, I'll go and buy Labrador. So I went and bought a dog because I thought, ha ha, the bank can't take that from me. <laughs> so I bought a Labrador and I was absolutely skin broke. And I, I was uh, the, the 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 business was going to get taken, and my bookkeeper, who was a, a Spanish guy, said, "Colin, you just got to sell your soul. You give them what they want." Yeah. So I put a huge banner outside the Stone Lee Hotel. Eat and drink all you can for twenty quid, as much food as much drink as you want for twenty quid, and we were stacked out. And I was giving them shittiest wine <laughs> i was giving them you know frozen food from cash and carries <laughs> and i was dying inside because it's not my style yeah, after yeah, working yeah. at two star michelin yeah. in paris <laughs> and now i'm serving deep fried god knows what but we were making money yeah you know and just watching the hotel just go to bits although we were making money it was just oh my god i never want to do that again and i sold it and i'd managed to get out there the skin of my teeth wounded and battered uh, but i got out of it and I thought, right, that's it. From now on, I'm only going into small quality, yeah. you know, small small um, volume, but high quality. So then I had, I had no business and I thought, I'll take it six months out. And I went eating around Europe for six months in all the best restaurants in Paris, in, in, in Spain, uh, in the UK, in fact. And I knew, right, this is what I want to do. So then I wanted to find an old place that I could build this new restaurant. And I came across, uh, while I was eating in these, these great places, I, I came across a restaurant called Wintering Fields. I thought, well, I'll go and eat there. It's got two stars. Let's go and eat there. So I, I was eating in there. I thought, this place is amazing. It reminded me of France with the terracotta tiles, the kind of farmhouse style. I thought, this is amazing. And I thought, this is exactly what I want to do. So I got on the phone to Christy and Co. And I said, right, I want you to find me an old barn somewhere, anywhere that I can do something. And he said, well, where have you been that, that, that you've got you all fired up? I said, well, I've been to this place called Winteringham Fields. And he said, it's on the market, you know. I'm like, are you <laughs> kidding me? Just like fate, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I said, I said well, well, that sounds amazing. I could just feel my heart skipping. But I thought, one, way out of my budget. Two, who buys a two mission style restaurant after selling the Stone Lee Hotel, right? Who does that? And I thought, no, I've got to get it in my mind. But I just couldn't shift it. And I, I, I was looking around the rest of the UK six months later. I'm still looking for these, these places. And I just couldn't find it. I kept going back to Wintering Fields in my mind. And at this point, Manchester United football team was being sold to an American guy. And I thought, God, if you can buy Manchester United, <laughs> you know, top of the Premier League, yeah, yeah. I'll buy Wintering Fields. So I negotiated a really good deal with, uh, with Annie and Jermaine Schwab, who, who you, couldn't have, you couldn't have bought a better business of a nicer couple. And they, I've, I've never met Annie and Jermaine, but I've heard great things. Oh, from, I mean, yeah. within the industry, they were, they were legendary. I mean, they, they, they run a business with an iron fist, and it was just five-star all the way, and yeah. they, they deserved all the credit that they got. But my worry is that I was never going to fill those shoes, right? So 
we, we, you know, she gave me a kind of a deal where I could pay back and I, she basically got my foot in the door because she, she had it on the market for about four years. No one wanted to buy it. Not that they didn't want to buy it, but everyone was scared of buying it because, you know, the day I take over is the day you lose two Michelin stars, yeah. the day you lose some of your staff, the day you start from scratch. Then what have you got? Just another restaurant. But I, I didn't realise that, so I, I, I bought it. And I, I went for it. And yes, I lost the two stars straight away and I lost half the staff. Uh, people were phoning up in the first week, cancelling their reservations because we didn't have two star anymore. And I thought, <laughs> what have I done? This is Stone Lee Hotel again. You know, this is going to be a nightmare. Um, so I think naivety plays a part in success. If you don't fully understand what you got yourself in for, then you don't really full, uh, fully understand how you can get your, you know, get caught short. And I think that's a big lesson in just doing it and finding out for yourself. Um, so we did start from scratch and I had to start my own team off and, and, um, and we just slowly, slowly built it up. And I just remember eating in these restaurants and just thinking that's what I want to serve. And, um, and I always remember saying, well, if, it really, if, if business really went to the wall, I would cook and Bex would serve. And that would be it. If we did 10 guests, then that would be it. So we knew we had a safety, a safety measure there. And, um, and then in 2008, the crisis hit. You know, and that just thought, right, this is it now. We're, we're, we're finished. We're out of it again. So we started going down different channels of how can we raise our own food to make it cheaper and, and bring down the cost of the menu. So we started having a few chickens. Well, they're easy. They're cheap. And with a chicken, there's your eggs for breakfast. Then we think, well, let's get a pig. You know, and pigs, great. There's, there's, if we can do a full English breakfast all on our own, yeah. the bacon, the eggs, the sausages, the, um, the black pudding and, and our own tomatoes. And so when someone had a full English, it was going to be ours. If you want eggs Benedict, there were our eggs, yeah. you know. And then it started growing. But hold on a minute. What about if we have lamb? And we started doing carrots and, and, and broccolis and cauliflowers. And the sustainability thing just grew. So we started having 10 acres, and then we started doing all of that. And then this sustainability trend kicked off, and I thought, well, we're already doing this. Um, we were market leaders at that point. You know, I wouldn't have had to grow a carrot five years ago, if you'd have asked me. Oh, I don't know. Different soils and stock rotation, what's all that about? But the guys in the village helped me out. They were local farmers. We were surrounded by local farmers. So we just got straight into that and, um, uh, and, and just learned, learned how to do it. And the menu cost came down and we only had a menu surprise, which meant you sat down and our customers only got the best of what was in that season that week. So if our tomatoes were amazing, that's what you got. Yeah. If our lamb were ready to go, I would take two of those lamb to slaughter, age them for a week, and then that would be it. That would be, that's what would be on the menu. So the cost of running the business was a lot less. We were wasting stuff. We were giving stuff that was the best at the time. And the staff were kept on their toes. They weren't doing the same fish and chips for six months at a time. They were like, what we're doing today? I've got this beautiful trout that's just come in, you know? We'd be ordering, um, we'd be ordering fish from a local, uh, a local um, fisherman who was 200 years old with a woolly cap and missing teeth. And he'd say, got this turbot. And we'd be cooking it. And that, that, that's the story of Wintering and Fields, you know? And now we are, we have our Michelin star back and we are probably, well, I think last week, TripAdvisor came out and we're top, top six yeah, in the I country. And was it like number six so, or Yeah, number six. And we're doing really well. Um, you know, we still haven't got to the heights of, wintry, of, of, of Annie and Germaine, but, you know, we're going to be proud with what we've done, for yeah, sure, especially in this climate yeah. as well. It's going to take a long time to, to, to build, isn't it? From but there were so many interesting things then, like, like from our experience with no film that, you know, when we set up, I think it is just about going out and doing it. And I think mm. when we set up, we were literally clueless. Like we knew how to make videos. We had a little bit of equipment, but we had no idea about business, about clients, about how to get out there, finance, yeah. about yeah. marketing, about anything. And we, you know, we rented a little office around the corner like, on Mary Street. We had like a one little, little SLR, didn't we? When we yeah. First set and, up and, um... and but actually, I don't. I don't. It's been tough at times, but I don't regret that journey to where we are because um, I still feel like we've got a, a hell of a long way to go but I think that the challenge is good but I think you learn a lot by you doing have to it. hit rock bottom you know I mean in the Stone Lee Hotel if I hadn't got that bad I mean if, if if I'd have just worked in the best places and had the best experience 
then I wouldn't have the thick skin needed yeah. to mm. deal with downturns in yeah. business and you know staff leaving and having to call the police on customers and, or having to um, you know how do I pay the bank back and stuff if you mm. don't go through that rock bottom pain you don't really appreciate how difficult it is to run a business and then when you are doing well you realize you know right I'm doing well because I've got, I've got all my, my ducks in order and, and like you, you kind said, of you need appreciate to hit, it yeah you need to hit rock, you, you like, need to hit uh, rock bottom and I think I mean we we always encourage um, like you know college and university but at the same time uh, I'll be 100% honest like we we both we've both got degrees in in digital film and TV yeah. and post-production but you know I think you just can't actually going out on shoots and it's the same way we learn most of what we do from a technical point of view with video um, through, you know, just going out and shooting. And then we learn the business side through dealing with, you know, we had loads of jobs in the early years that paid nothing and <laughs> the clients were difficult but actually it's we've learned so much from that. Well it's the best way to do it because I mean, for example, chefs they're really good at cooking, but not all chefs can be business owners you know you're a cook and that's it you know uh, a lot of business owners can't can't be chefs and I think if you're just customer focused to start with and you get what you you just get the customer sorted the business will all will fit in nicely together you know and do you find is that in in your industry is that I know every restaurant's different especially with fine dining and Michelin style everyone has their own brand but is it um is that common for it to be a kind of chef owner or is it does uh, it tend to be the builder team? A lot of the chefs think they can be owners. They go, hey, look at me, I, I'm running this bit, I'm running this kitchen, uh, I'm doing my costings, I'm buying the dish costing menu in, I'm buying the ingredients, I know how many chefs I need. Um, but it doesn't mean they make good business people. Um, because actually running a, a restaurant is only 10% cooking. The rest of it is dealing with front of house and holidays and wages and taxes and cash flow. And cash flow is key, isn't it? So it's dealing more with all of that. You take the chef out of the kitchen and they go, no, no, I, I'm, not, I'm, I'm a chef, so I need to be in the kitchen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it doesn't work like that, you know? Um, so, and, and that often ends in disaster when they decide they, they leave their, their, their employment and go, no, I'm gonna start off by myself. And then they suddenly, you know, I've had, I've had CVs from chefs that go and look at their CV and they've worked in really good places and then I've taken a year out. And I, oh, what happened in that year out? Well, I went on my own and started my own business and it went to shit. And, and so now I'm back out again. And that's a common thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, so not everyone can be business people, but I think if you are an entrepreneur where you think that there's a market out there for a certain niche, then yeah, you do it. And as long as you keep fighting, then you will, you'll make it, right? Sounds as though Wintering and Fields is stronger and more unique and better off for, for going through that, you know, the, the motions with yeah, it. Yeah, well, because you've you gone through all the motions and because you've hit rock bottom, you start to be more conservative about how you grow. So we always grow and then consolidate. And when we consolidate, we put bells and, uh, belt and braces and scaffolding and so on and so on to make sure we don't go past that lower level. Yeah. Then we grow and then we consolidate. And we, so you're building this big tower of every time you build a new level, you consolidate and polish that off. And then you take another level and so on and so on. So it'd be very, I can't, it'd be, have to be catastrophic, like maybe a, a pandemic to really take you down because <laughs> who'd have thought two years ago that you know a pandemic's going to come along know, and, yeah, and, yeah. and then take you and put you on your knees yeah. you know we were really strong two years ago um and i've got to admit a year ago i'm thinking god am i going to get through this you know can you imagine all of what i've just said now was going to go down the sink in in the pan just because of a, a pandemic yeah it's, uh, you know um so we, we've had to use the government's funds wisely to make sure that we um we can fight another day yeah i know um i've spoke to Obviously, Gaz, the head chef in, um, at Wintering and Fields, just about the, obviously, pandemic and everything. But it was good to see that when Dawes you know, was allowed to reopen again, the demand was... Well, because, I mean, Wintering and Fields is a, a celebratorial place, right? Yeah. You come for your anniversary, you come for your birthday. You can, so all of these won't be closed for that year. You know, all, all their missed birthdays, all the missed anniversaries, all the missed, uh, oh, I graduated, or, or whatever it may be. So... It's like a coiled spring, you know, it's held back and then BAM! I think you're a great example of, if, I guess it's like calcul businesses calculating risks all the way. It is. Otherwise, you're 
My my Sounds analogy still. is is playing chess, right? You know, you play chess and you either do, oh, do I sacrifice that pawn because I want that queen. I, can, I think I can get them into checks. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And and even just running a business is like playing chess. Yeah. Who who's who's gonna who's gonna leave me next? Even though there's no sign of anyone leaving this, but what about if my restaurant manager left? What about if my head chef left? What would I do next? Who would take that spot? And who would do this? And who? You've got to have this forward futuristic strategy that. You, you imagine all these scenarios happening and you fit them into a plan that if it does happen, you've covered. And they just think, hey, you're a bloody mind reader. How did you manage that so well? Well, because you just imagined all these scenarios that can happen, just like playing chess. Uh, maybe you let someone go because they are, you know, they're, 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 they're not good for the team, and, but they're really val valuable. You know, sometimes you've got to let go of your queen in, in chess yeah. to, to win the game. And so I imagine it like that, you know, by, by playing chess and strategizing like that. And you have to have time out of the kitchen to strategize. And I suppose that takes us on to why I've taken a sabbatical out of Wintringham to, uh, to think more clear about how, how best to take the business. Yeah, so, you know, people might have seen that you're on this amazing global adventure. Yeah. Um, what, if we go right back, what was the initial spark? For, the, for that idea. Do you know what, I think exp explaining, you know, about the hard work of Wintering and Fields, that's fine, you know, but I've been doing this since I was 16 and I think, God, is this, is this it? Is this what, is this all I've got to offer? It's just work every day in the kitchen. I, you know, what about the, the kids that I've got? I've got three, three daughters who are doing their, um, you know, the, 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 the end of their schooling, doing their, all their exams and what support have I given them? You know, I'm just working in my kitchen. You know, I've missed their birthdays. I've missed lots of sacrificial kind of things that I've done just to make sure that I can focus on my business. So I think, God, there's more, there must be more to it than this, you know. And if I just chase Michelin stars or just chase accolades, suddenly when you get them, you think, what are all that stuff I've sacrificed for this? Was it really worth it? So, you know, I started thinking, you know, what do I like to do? And, and when I go on holiday, what, what do I like to do? Well, I love sailing. I love, I love the, the freedom of just being on anchor and going, this is great, this is, this is amazing. So then I start thinking, well, what, what would happen if I did that for real? And how would that look and how would business look? So I decided to put a plan together two years ago that I would empower the staff that I've got and to see if they can run the business without me being there. And it turns out that, yeah, that they, they can. So, yeah, I bought a boat and uh, I wanted to give the kids a bit of payback time that I, you know, so I thought, what, what better adventure to do than sail around the world? Yeah. Uh, and I don't want them to be too, um, het, you know, kind of caught up with, with what's happening. I just hate the way the kids are all on their mobile phones 24-7. They can't have a meal without checking what's going on. They can't wake up in the morning first thing to check their phone and got their eyebrows like slugs. And, and, and I'm like, oh, keep <laughs> God, why aren't you serious? And if yeah, they've got a yeah. spot, they can't leave the house. And I can't, yeah, teenagers have done that since time's gone on, you know, uh, care about their views and their looks and stuff like that. But I wanted them to see the, the bigger picture of, of what's going on in the world. I want them to, to get an education hands-on you know I think one of their first um, when we were in Italy one of their first homeschool projects was learning about the Roman Empire and guess where we were we were in Rome at the time I thought Let, let's go and see uh, the Colosseum let's go kick the tires and feel it and smell it and imagine it and and he, I, I he can't beat that I wanted to give them an adventure of self-responsibility what is it like being in the middle of a, the Atlantic Ocean with your family you are responsible for their health and safety they play a big part in that there's a lot of um, a lot of um, responsibility and I want to give them self reliability you know if need, something needs to be done it's not oh dad how do I do that no you figure it out so I want them to give the life lessons that they need to do what they want to do I want them to know that they can do whatever they want you know if they think they can do it they can do it you know uh, because you think you can and, and that's a big, big mental thing that I've got with them, is I want them to just um, don't be too curtailed with people's views and on social media. Uh, you know, you do what you want to do, do what makes you happy, and you're going to win. Um, and they've had a great time doing it. You know, they, they've thoroughly enjoyed it, and uh, they've, they've come home now after being away for two years, and they're meeting their old friends, and, and I'm sure they've got their own views of, oh, God, you've changed a bit. Is it me that's changed or you've changed? And, uh, not that that's so important, but it's nice for them to reflect about what they've learned and how they've grown as, as kids and people. Um, 
and the education side of it, they're taking the self-responsibility for educating themselves as well, you know. Do you want to tell us a little bit about, um, so the journey started, you picked the boat up in, the boat's called Sailing the Recipe, you picked it up in Rome? Picked it up in Rome, yeah, picked it up in Rome, bought a boat, again, didn't know much about sailing really, I mean, I've done some sailing say, holidays. What, what, where, where did it go from kind of this, you know, travel and experiencing to actually living on on a boat and was that I mean before we did all this I'd had three one week holidays so every year for the three weeks for every year for one week I'd take uh, I'd hire a boat and that is my that's my experience so you went from one week to so two years yeah yeah so literally I found uh, I, f I found a boat online and said well oh, that's oh, that looks nice so, you know I think we could all live on there it needs to be big enough that we can all five of us live on it without killing each other so we went for a catamaran um, you know, they're spacious, they're, they're safe, and um, they're great for liverboards. So, yeah, we bought it in Rome. And a um, bit of a disaster, you know. The, the Buying a boat is probably one of the most complicated things you can do. It's just the amount of red tape and, and, and dealing with the Italians at the time. I was just... It's not just a case of like buying a car where you're like... Get your yeah, yeah go you know, it, yeah. Re registration <laughs> and the coast guards. Is it buying a... A house and a <laughs> boat together and put it all and a yeah. business stick it all together and that's pretty yeah. much what it's like buying a boat. Uh, did I know that? No. Uh, do I know it now? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the, just the anxiety as well of leaving Rome for the first time and going to Sardinia and having the most horrendous journey yeah, I ever. You telling me about you know we were going into um, you know like... kind of ten foot waves. Uh, blowing uh, 30 knots in our face. I was throwing up. We had two two pugs on board. They were throwing up. I mean, have you ever seen a, a dog throwing up, sliding up and down <laughs> the boat? It was, uh, it was hilarious, you know. And, and all the, everyone was sick, except for Bex. Yeah. And it dawned on me, what have I done? Just like buying Wintering Fields the first week, thinking, you know, what have I done? And I, I was seriously doubting, God, this is, this is a shitty idea. I'm, I'm just going to rent this boat out and go back to work because yeah. this is horrendous. It wasn't fun at all. And when we got to uh, Sardinia, the kids were like, Daddy, what are we doing? You know? And I promised you, okay, kids, we're never going to do that kind of journey again. I'm going to, this time I'll look at the weather. You know, uh, yeah. didn't realise <laughs> so you had to do that. Looking, yeah, didn't like, realise you had to look at the weather, yeah. you know, or tides, currents, what's that, you know? Um, and by the time we'd got into Sardinia, the boat was just covered in sick and, and red wine down the side of the boat. And it was just, it was rough. Um, but then we just carried on slowly that summer, just making our way down to uh, the east coast of Spain. And we became professional sailors. We would really learn how to, how to do it. I was going to say, when me and Luke came out and we joined you in Menorca, um, you looked like you were seasoned. Yeah, yeah. You, you were all, like, you all work together so well as well. The yeah, the kids, were, I mean, the kids have really right, become yeah. crew because you have to treat the kids like crew in regards to the room has to be immaculate, the kitchen has to be done, and uh, everything has to be ship shape or else it becomes unsafe uh, and cluttered is, is, is not cool. So uh, I think that's a good life lesson for them as well. Um, but, yeah, now, now we're really confident with the boat. I mean, crossing the Atlantic was a real test of, of, of courage. Again, naivety. You don't know about the big storms or squalls that come at you, you know, 70 miles an hour squalls. You think, geez, you know, if I knew that, I wouldn't have done it, you know. But because you are, you don't know that and you do it for the first time, mm. and when you do hit a big storm, you think, Jesus, God, the boat's shaking and rattling away and you're thinking, oh, God. And if you'd uh, known that was going to come, answer. you wouldn't have done it. Or you'd have been you know, le less uh, inclined to do it. But that's, ex you know exactly what you were saying earlier, you wouldn't have, like with business, you wouldn't, there's, I think there's a lot of people out there that I think it's quite sad that they never make that leap to do what they want to do because there's imagine always... Because imagine if they had done it. It's like sliding doors thing something. in that film. You know, this yeah. is me now if I don't do it. And maybe yeah. if I hadn't have done what I did, I'd just been working as a head chef somewhere. Mm. Uh, but now, no, I did that. I, I took all that risk yeah. and I'm here. And it's the kind of thing, and if I had never bought the boat... Or oh, never sailed the Atlantic. I'd still sit in the If you in could have fast forwarded to that storm and then not, you wouldn't have bought the boat and you exactly, wouldn't be where yeah. you are now. Same like Wintering of Fields. As someone said to me, right, if you buy this place, you will lose your two stars. You will, you know, be skint and you will have enormous pressure and you will do it. Do you want to buy it now? And you'd have probably gone, nah, that's okay. But you've, it's an adventure, right? You've got to do it or else life's a bit boring. So, um, we are so proud of the girls and, and the team of, of, of crossing the Atlantic because, you know, it was a real moment of just pulling into St. Lucia at four o'clock in the morning. You can see the hue of the lights 
coming over the horizon and you're thinking, oh, that's St. Lucia, we've crossed the ocean. And you don't realise how big it is until you fly home yeah. on an eight hour journey and you look down and all you see is sea. And, and Olivier flying home this week was like, God, you know, yeah. it's, just, it's just vast ocean. You can't see anything, just a horizon of eight hours. You know, you have your meal on the plane and you look out, it's still there. And then you have a snooze, you wake up, it's still ocean. You know, you and how long did it take, Colin? To 14 days. 14 days. days. 14 days. And what kind of speed? So we were doing kind of eight knots, seven to, seven to eight knots. Um, What's that roughly? I know it is. We were doing about 100, 180 miles a day. Um, right. So eight miles, seven miles an hour, something right. like that. Um, and you got to deal with the idea of just being absolutely bored out of your mind for 14 days because you can't get off. You can't do anything. You've just got to sit. You get the sail set and, right, I'll have a coffee. And so so yeah. what, is that quite, is it a nice kind of therapeutic type thing or is it actually like, I'm bored? <laughs> if you think about <laughs> freedom, you can't get more freer than, than when you look around and you haven't seen and you lose your sense of smell, right? Because everything is one dimensional. Everything smells the same. Everything looks the same. Everything feels the same. Um, it, it just there's no there's no there's nothing going on outside there. Just your little boat. Um, the kids are doing the same things. They're watching the same movies. Just playing the same card games. Uh, but once you you once you're at ease with doing nothing, and after with what I've been doing the last ten years is working every day, uh, from God knows what time in the morning till evening. I'm used to having something in my mind that I need to do, uh, and now hold on a minute, I, I can't get off this boat. I have to sit here and do nothing. I'm watching the waves pass me, and if the dolphins come along, it's like, hey, this is this is exciting, you know. Or if you see a ship in the distance, hey, this is someone else, because you realise it's two thousand mile journey. And when you're at the thousand mile mark halfway, the closest people to you are in the space station above, right? So you think, Ooh, that's, wow. that's, a, that's a thought, isn't it? You are, if something happened to me now, you know, you, you have to get yourself out of it. You can't call the Coast Guards. You have to get yourself out. You end up in a life raft in the middle of the Atlantic. Where you land, no one knows. When you're in the middle of the ocean, it's five kilometers deep. It's 2,000 miles that way, 2,000 miles that way, and it's just you and the ocean. You start thinking like that, yeah. you start becoming overwhelmed with what you're doing. Yeah. Whereas if you're like me, just watching movies and just having coffee and thinking, oh, this is a nice day again, not knowing that it's five kilometers deep, not knowing that you've got another 10 days, not knowing there's a big storm coming ahead, um, you know, that's the best way to do it. So sometimes being naive to the risks is, is sometimes a good thing. The one, one thing that asked him lately was um, when you went to Mexico um, yeah. and you did the cooking with yeah. the lady yeah, the yeah. and the cook at the table. Yeah, that looked amazing. But it's just mind-blowing that you sometimes got to pinch yourself that one minute we're leaving Rome, yeah. next minute we're in Mexico, in the middle of the Yucatan Peninsula, looking at these Mayan temples, cooking with this old bird who's in her 50s, who's on Netflix burying food in the ground. And I'm thinking, this is a cra This is exactly what I wanted to do. You know, it was to get inspiration, see different cultures, let the kids see different cultures, different languages, different ingredients, different methods of cooking. That was the, that was the, the mission statement, right, from the day go. And I think we really ticked that, um, seeing this lady from Netflix, um, you know, Rosalia. She, she was fantastic. Um, what an experience that was, you know, to sit with her and... and um, bury food and wait four hours and cook it and what was it like was it good it nice. was awesome yeah it really was i mean it was it, i ate more tacos and drank more margaritas than, <laughs> than uh, more avocados and guacamole with chips yeah, um yeah I've, 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 I'm, I'm an expert in guacamole and tacos now but um but then i i enjoyed going back and going back to the the kitchens and, and trying to do it myself and that, that was quite interesting um but yeah no that was the kind of place that had a different culture because to be honest when you're in the Caribbean the culture is pretty much the same um, and big cities are all the same whether you're in New York or Dubai or, or Sydney yeah. they're all skyscrapers they've all got restaurants they've all got coffee shops and you know they all speak English and there's not real difference of cultures but when you start going into the Yucatan Peninsula then you're really seeing a different culture yeah, yeah. when you go to Cuba and you're walking through Havana and you, there's people smoking these big cigars and <laughs> drinking their uh, their calibres and things. You think, God, this is this is culture. Yeah, this yeah. is different. This you wouldn't you can't get this anywhere else in the world. 
You can't get the Yucatan Peninsula anywhere else in the world. Uh, and that's what I wanted. You know, when you went to Florida, ah, it's okay, you know, it's, it's skyscrapers and big, big highways. Um, so many places. Is there any other places, you know, in terms of um, cooking and cuisine and, you know, like you were talking about earlier with the guacamole and yeah. is there any other, anybody else you've met? Well, with? if you think of it, for example, countries and cuisine, you know, a lot, again, some of them are similar. Yeah, you go to Italian restaurants, it's the pasta, that, that's their thing. You know, you go to um, India, it's the curries, that's their thing. When you go to Mexico, it's them spices, the chilies and the, the drinks, you know, that's their thing. Um, but the rest of it is all pretty much the same. I mean, the Caribbean food is it's boring. It's fish and rice pretty much everywhere you go. Um, so it was nice to see these countries that had cultural identity with food. And I, re I really like that. I remember you saying you, you really enjoy the guy who's on the street corner cooking Street it, food. Because uh, he loves doing it. And yeah. And there's no, you mentioned when we filmed you, before you went out on the recipe, you're saying it's that freedom of cooking. Like, obviously, when you have a star or um, the, the pressure that that brings yeah, yeah, every year to kind of retain retain that star, retain that star, because obviously, obviously, if you lost it, then people go, oh, what's that? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and you said, yeah, you absolutely love the idea of just doing street food because there's no pressure. Well, that guy, like I said, who's cooking in his flip-flops, who's just doing, you know, some tacos or nachos or just uh, barbecue or some, you know, cockroaches on a spit, um, you think, ah, oh, it's really interesting food. And it, it, it's fantastic. It's cheap. Uh, it's interesting. It, you know, that's when you get most of your inspiration, actually. Um, and it, does it get the passion going again? Yeah, I mean, I mean, yes, yeah, so when I talk about the Caribbean food, it's quite bland. But, you know, when you get some, some guy cooking in an old uh, scuba tank uh, <laughs> thing, that's, he's, welded, he's cut it in half and welded it and put coals on, and he's just doing some jerk chicken that is, you know, hot as. But the lady's got the pestle and mortar making that marinade. Oh, yeah. And um, that's cool. That's interesting, you know, and that's by the beach and, and the sun's on the back of you and you're eating these little skewers or kebabs, um, having a cold beer and having these, because um, uh, obviously the Caribbean, the spice islands, nutmegs, cinnamons, vanillas, um, turmerics and, and things like that. There's lots of spices in those and, you know, how they use it is quite interesting. So, yeah, I do. I, I go back to gas and say, hey, gas, you know, well, you know, you're doing that Wagyu beef, that sticky, have you tried... Uh, Glazing it with this, 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 this is oh no, that's really interesting. I said, try it, it's good. I've got to say, I did go a couple of months ago, and I did have the wagyu beef. Oh yeah, and it was amazing. Was it? It was. was it? Yeah, it was. Yeah. Um, you know when something's really amazing, I always say to guys, when something's really amazing, you have to put your knife and fork down. Yeah. And go. <laughs> and go how does that? Yeah. How does that taste so good? And I've seen people do it. As you know, Wintering Field's got a big screen in the TV yeah. in the um, in the kitchen with cameras in the restaurant. It's not to spy on people or it's just to help service along. But sometimes you see, they cry. Some people can cry. They look at it and go, oh my God. And how does that make you feel <sighs> on the other side? See, well, this, this goes back to what I'm talking about with my grandmother. Yeah. You can't be doing something. Can you imagine doing something, cooking something with your heart and soul and making someone cry? Uh, how cool is that? It's like the same with us when we've done films, be that when we used to do wedding films or we've done kind of yeah. a corporate film or something, we've brought like somebody's brand or somebody that, like a business that somebody's worked so hard for and then when you've told it the story in like a film, maybe they've shed like a few tears and stuff and it goes, it's similar for us. It's emotional. Yeah, we've, we've had it with weddings because you, you, obviously that that's personal to someone so it's, yeah, they're going to yeah, get emotional. Yeah, but we've yeah. had it with brands where they've maybe not had a video done before. They've got... Again, an interesting story. We do a lot of brand storytelling type videos. Yeah. And, and it, it takes just, it's that emotional response when you see, you, you guess you've, it, it's an emotional thing, the process of creating it. So, and, and you really care about what you're doing yeah. as well. So when they, when you see that response from them, it's like, wow, I want to cry now, you know. I'm <laughs> but that's it. And, and, and then, it's, then yeah. materialistic stuff goes out the window. You realise, oh, I'm not doing this for money. Yeah. I'm doing it because of that. Yes, and if you do that lots of times, well, guess what? You will make money because everyone wants to experience that. So if you can focus on making people cry or put their cutlery down, and that's all you care about, the pennies will help. The pennies will, will turn into pounds yeah. and so on and so on because all you're really focused on is 
cooking something that's going to make people go, put the cutlery down and go. Because you see it around a table of four. The first thing you do, you look at it. And then you look at your plate. You look at their plate. You, know, you do that. You go, oh, this is nice. And you start nodding at people. Then they take the first mouthful and then look at each other. They go, mm, it's good, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, and then that's it. But when you are just eating you know, with your wife or whatever, and you go, oh, my God. How has he done that? And then and they're licking yeah, the plate. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and if you weren't in a posh <laughs> restaurant, they'd be picking up, <laughs> licking the plate. You know, uh, yeah, that's just, that's fantastic. Yeah. So that's the mission statement in the kitchen is to say, how can we uh, provoke people's emotions, uh, whether it's uh, nostalgic, we've talked about that many times, because uh, food is nostalgic, but it's about making people think, that, yeah, this is amazing, and then they're happy to pay yeah. for the bill. It's not, it's not, the minute they identify with the ingredients on the plate and they put a value on it, they go, oh, yeah, I could do it cheaper than myself. You know, yeah. how many times have you heard people go, I cook better at home? Or uh, you might have a piece of, uh, a cheap piece of meat, or let's say pork belly. Pork belly, oh my day, you couldn't give it away. All that stuff. And I'm paying 100 pounds for this, and all I'm getting is uh, pork belly and, um, you know, uh, tripe. You see, yeah. I don't get that, because it, it, when you go to you know Winchcom and Fields, it's um, it's it it takes you away to another place yeah. for the evening, and that's what it is. It's not look at the quantity of I can get a I can get go to an all you can eat buffet for yeah. far quid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's yeah. like I feel full, but I feel I'm bloated, and yeah. it all tastes the same. And, yeah, and I mean, it's you, not a nice. You don't go to Winchcom and Fields necessarily to satisfy the hunger pangs, although. There is a cliche, people who have never been go, oh, you need fish and chips on the way home. <laughs> you go, really? Yeah. If you do, you probably have come to the wrong restaurant. You should have gone to the all-inclusive buffet. Um, yeah, of course, it needs to satisfy the hunger. It needs to tick all those boxes. But more importantly, I want you to walk away and go, that's the best experience I've had yeah. eating out. Yeah, and because yeah. although it's not designed to be challenging, you know, we don't want to be like, I'm a celebrity, get you out of here. Here, here's, here's a pair of bull's balls. It's 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 eating something perhaps you've never had before yep. um, and, and pushed your boundaries a little bit that you're happy with. You're proud of yourself for trying something you've never done before because, as you know, Wintering Fields, there is no menu. Mm. You sit down and you're fed, again, what is the best at this time of year, in this season, in this month, in this week. And you sit down and you're fed. And, of course, if you had a choice, if you knew what was on the menu, if it was written down, you said, oh, yes, I'll have that. But can you take out this, 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 because I'm not really too keen on that. Well, then you're stripping away the identity of what the menu is. Mm. But because you don't have that, you're forced to eat yeah. it. And of course, you can say, I don't like um, shellfish, and I'm allergic to this, and I really don't like that. Then, of course, no problem. We can amend it for you. But what about if you just turn up and you forget to say, I don't like oysters, and guess what? The first course is oysters. You go, oh, dear. And you eat it, and then you think, that's... Yeah, that's, that's, that's nice. Yeah. I like oysters now. Because you, as a kid, you saw someone gipping on eating oysters. You go, well, I'm not going to do that. Or at school, I hated mushrooms, so I won't like them anymore now. And oftentimes, when you say, I don't like something, it's because you've had a bad experience many, many, many years ago as a kid. You, your parents used to force feed uh, cauliflower. I can't have cauliflower anymore. So you've never had it yeah. in 20 years. When I was younger, there was, um, there was a time where... I think someone said, oh, try some beetroot or something. I tried something, it was just like out of jail, like, it was minging, hating it. <laughs> Went to, I think it was the last time I was at the fields, there was a dish that came out, it was beetroot. <laughs> and I was like, I can't do it. No, nah. and then I was like, well, I'm going to try it. I just did it, and it was amazing. Yeah. It was so good. I was yeah. like, I want more. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. I mean, like I said, it shouldn't be challenging, but it should be rewarding to um it should be rewarding to um should be challenging but it should be rewarding that you've experienced something yeah. you just don't want to come and have pine peas yeah that you can get anywhere you want to do and something I love that, that you um, can't get. when you go as well it's like you just put in all the trust in the chef you know like well that's what i'm saying for the people who have had the beetroot that trust it for the people who have the uh, oyster now they realize god when i go to wintering fields i trust that what i'm going to get will be cooked to its best abilities that i probably will like it so do you know what? Yeah, I'm going to go to Winterfields because I trust that uh, if I don't like um, avocados and it's done, well, I, might, I think I might, I think I like it. You've kind of mentioned it a few times of like be that chefs you've taken on or something, you know, like from the village and stuff and you've kind of just trained them up from thinking. I about remember you telling, when we was on the boat, you was telling me about uh, just the, the, the kind of approach of, 
you know, when they come in, if they're going to sweep the floor, they need to do it. Yeah. Th think about the process of doing it and do it well. And then you can take that, those, yeah. that mindset into the kitchen when you pre And that was fascinating. When someone comes into my kitchen, regardless of the accolades or regardless of what skills, or regardless of what qualifications I've got, is, is, is the mindset to do something. And, and anyone who's happy to work hard, that's what I say to my kids, is if you don't do well at school, that's fine, but it's your personality that's gonna get you there, yeah. not, not your brains. Um, you, any, any personality can get you into any job. Uh, you can talk, you, talk yourself into it, you know? Uh, I think someone said, like Richard Branson, he says, if you're ever offered a job you know you can't do, yeah. just say yes. Yeah. Because it's better to try the job and mess it up yeah. and get that experience then say no, because you don't want to look a, a fool for failing. You know, so just say yes to everything and see what happens. So the guys that work for me, yeah, they come in and I've, I've worked in this kitchen, this kitchen. I say, well, you need to be able to sweep the floor. Yeah. And they go, sweep, sweep. no, I don't sweep the floor. And yes, it's about everything you do it has to yeah. be the best, the quickest, because the biggest thing that anyone can ever have is their own reputation. If you have your reputation, uh, then that's the only thing you can wake up in the morning with, you know. And if you are the fastest pot washer, the fastest sweep cleaner and the best sweep cleaner, the best uh, uh, plate polisher. If you can do it faster, quicker and cleaner than anyone else, then you move on to the next level. By the time you get to fill it a hundred pounds piece of fish, you're going to be the fastest, the cleanest, yeah. the quickest. And, and everyone goes, oh, look at John. How does he fill it that fish so quick? He's now got a reputation. You know, and if you can have that, then people admire that and respect it. And that's how you get respect. Um, when I clean the floor, if anyone can beat me cleaning the floor, oh, no, 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 I'll, I'll do the floor today, guys, because <laughs> I want to regain my accolade to be the best floor sweeper. Yeah. You know, and if they, see, if they see me having fun with that, then they think it's okay now to sweep the floor. Why is it not okay? You know, suddenly, why is that a shitty job? You know, it, it's a part of it. Um, so that's why you can have fun with that. So yeah, I'm happy to take anyone with any qualifications and turn them into a, um, a usable cook um, and whatever they want to do after that, that's fine. But once they work in wintering fields, because it's so regimented, so organized and, and so systematic that um, it, it, it just it teaches you so much, um, so many skills and so much life skills to go on and do other things once you've got that mindset. Is that something that, like, you know, you've developed at Winter and Fields, like, obviously in business to talk about systems and everything, is that kind of... Yeah, because when, when we've shot in the kitchen, I'm always like, it's so, it's so quiet and calm yeah. in here, like, people do have that vision of... Well, going back to France, you know, remember yeah. how I told you, the French yeah. thing, yeah. throwing pots and pans, yeah, yeah. effing and jeffing and throwing things and <laughs> getting you up by the neck and, <laughs> and working 60 hours a, a, a day, yeah. uh, you know... No, I'd said that if I have my own place, it's not going to be like that. You're going to be nice as pie to your staff because your biggest asset is your staff. So why would you not, why would you treat your biggest asset like idiots? Why would you treat them like shit? Why don't you treat your biggest asset like the queen? Well, it makes sense, doesn't it? You know, if they're your biggest asset, if you recognize it's the biggest asset, not your bricks and mortar or your plates or your fancy cutlery. No, it's your staff. Yeah. Um, There's like so, that wheel, isn't there, where it's like in business, where it's like, you as the business owner, it's not um, kind of like, it is like the business that what takes care of you, but it's like you look after your staff, your staff look after your customers. Yeah. Your customers and then look after your business and your business kind of looks after you. Yeah. So it's kind of- Suddenly, it's suddenly if it's their business, yeah. then th that's all you want from them. And f to allow them to feel like that, you have to let them into the business. You let them in financially, as in uh, let them know how much things cost. Let them know that this fish is a hundred pounds and the reason why I'm a bit precious about you filleting it is because if you get it wrong, not only we've just killed the fish that we have to now, you, you, you can't use all of it because of respect for the product, but uh, if you get it wrong, you know, it's a lot of money to waste. I can't use it anymore. So yeah, letting them empower them with uh, getting to see the customers. We invite customers into the kitchen so the staff can see that, because I mean, th this is the whole thing about the industry as well. The guys in the kitchen don't see the customers. If I said to a chef, cook me a plate, plate of food, whatever you want, and, I'm, and then you are gonna take it to the customer and watch them eat it. They're not gonna serve up slap and make it cold and the plate's dirty because they have to sit there in front of the customer, red-faced, going, oh, sorry about that, was it cold? And uh, sorry about that, was it, was it raw? 
you know, so the minute they have to uh, imagine that they're the ones going to serve it, because obviously the waiters have to serve it, they're the ones who have to get embarrassed if it gets sent back. Um, and, and then who's going to pay for it? So the, the guys in the kitchen have to have that, that uh, intimate relationship with the customers. So that's why we, we invite the customers to the kitchen and we introduce them. How oh, this is the guy who did your fish, this is the guy who did your meat. Yeah. And they go, hi, Paul, hi, Paul. Imagine having the fish sent back and then the customers come down and say, <laughs> He's the one who cooked your fish. And he's like, oh my God. Yeah. You see? I'm not going to so, do it again, is yeah, it? Yeah, it's reputation. Yeah. And that's why I like the restaurant. You know, that's why I like what I do. And having this, this uh, sabbatical off. Yeah, do I miss it? Yeah, too right. Have you been tempted since you've been back to, you know, go, go in the kitchen? Oh, I, I, I feel like a spare wheel. <laughs> I go back and... Uh, well, first of all, you know, we've had a, over the last two years, you know, as, as the industry moves on uh, and COVID and we've hired new people and some people have gone. And so some people don't know who I am. <laughs> Walked into the kitchen the other day, I was talking to the pastry guy and I'm like, morning guys, morning, shaking everyone's hand, da 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 da. And as I walk out, the pastry chef says to Gaz, the pastry chef says, who's that? <laughs> Gaz oh, like, was a customer. Gaz something. like, <laughs> you're, you're joking me, right? Let's, let's call him, you know. So you, are you, so you're not involved with, um, the, the recruitment, or oh, is that just gas? again as part of my leaving process? I have to empower other people to employ the people they want to employ because they need to work with them. You know, Gaz has to employ the kitchen guys because he's the one that can either see potential, he's the one that's going to get irritated with any mannerisms this guy might have, he's the one that's going to have to work with him. And same with the front of house with Xavier, he needs to employ them. Um, they have, they have constraints with, I don't know, contracts and salaries and God knows what, but the rest of it is up to them. And they're doing really well. And because, you know, the last two and a half years, apart from the, the COVID pan pandemic, they've, they've been doing really, really well. I'm very proud of them. Yeah. And I think they're really keen to, to because I was, imagine if I left and then it all went down the pan. Yeah. What, what does that say about them? You know, and they've been working there for 10 years. And they can't, you know, I can't go away for a year. No, it just shows you that am I really needed there? <laughs> <You know? laughs> I uh, think that's when you've been, when you, a sign that you have built like a strong business, though, isn't yeah, it? When you yeah. can when you can take that time off in the business yeah. that you've built, the staff and the Very team nice. around it can run itself. Like, and again, it's not thinking too materialistic because the minute you start thinking about oh, it's cost me more money to, for me to be away, and and what about if they're doing this is going to cost me more? No, it's about I sleep better at night knowing that they are enjoying the power that they can run their own business. I, I sleep better at night knowing that they uh, are trusted, that they are learning and growing as people as well. And um, that only comes back on me as a, um, as a reward and, and it benefits them. Cool. So what's your plans next for with the Sell recipe. the restaurant now. <laughs> <laughs> if anybody wants. <laughs> yeah, call me. Uh, no, the pl the plan the plan now is um, I've learned that I don't have to um, spend sixteen hours behind a stove anymore to be successful in in the restaurants. You know, I think now I can build and grow other restaurants, and if I if I have it, the appetite to do it again. I will, I'll build another restaurant. I've got, I think I've got the reputation to, if I open a place, it will do well um, because we care an awful lot about, again, people's experience. Um, and I don't need, I can, in, I can get people to do, to, to paint, to help paint my vision. It's like a blank canvas, you know, and you say, oh, this is what I want. And, and then they put a bit of on there, they put their ideas onto it and, and we can grow businesses. So I still think I've got another restaurant in me. I still feel as if I've got, more to achieve and more to do. And I think me being away for the two years has really uh, clarified that for me that, you know, I've still got lots more to do. And I think it's been the best thing I've done by taking a step out to take two steps forward. Mm. What do you think, yeah, next, what would, would you kind of go down the same route as Wintering Fields? Or would it no, no. Like? Street food. Yeah. <laughs> I think you could be on to win it. There's yeah, a big, yeah, um, there's a massive know. street food market at the moment. You know, um, when I say street food, I think a, a lot of a lot of um, there's a great restaurant in Leeds called Man Behind the Curtain. He gets his inspiration from street food. You know, um, great flavor combination. You know, a hot dog with mustard. Great. What what is it? It's great great brioche bread with a great piece of meat in between with a nice seasoning. If you can take the hot dog on into a 
re- revamp it into a gastronomic yeah, yeah. mouthful. Why can't we do that? Why can't you get a gastronomic burger? A Wagyu burger? With, I mean, think about how, the, how it's made up. Why not? You know, I don't want to kind of reinvent the wheel, but um, Could be an everyone, likes, burger. everyone likes a good burger. So yeah. why don't you just do the best burger? Why don't you just do the best um, fish and chips? Do you know what? It's, it's funny, actually. I've got to say that when, my, when, we're, when we're at sea for, I don't know, 14 days, we start to, because we're a foodie family, we start to kind of imagine, oh, when I get back, I'm going to eat this and I'm going to eat that. And the kids miss, miss English food, you know, although they, they, they love my cooking and things, but they love school dinners, for example. They go, I love it when they have like pie and chips and gravy. And I say, what do you mean sauce? No, gravy. You know, the, the, the instant gravy mix yeah, that they yeah. put in school dinners. <laughs> they love that. They love yeah. this, the, um, the, the, um, the jam roly poly and custard. I'm like, really? The, yeah. But it's nostalgic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, you know, it's we went to the we went to the yeah. local pub, not to my pub. We went to the local pub, and they do this kind of instant gravy, and uh, crinkle chip cook uh, fries, unless that's, that's all they want. Mm. You know, pie, and th- they want uh, fish and chips from a chippy, yeah. the yeah. soggy soggy chips and greasy fish with gravy, and mushy peas or curry sauce. So it's amazing what you yeah. what food you miss and and how food nostalgia or memories uh provoke an emotion say yeah that's what i want to eat when i get home that shows how powerful that is you know if you're literally seeing all these different cultures cuisines and you're still thinking about home in that through food yeah is that something that you know like the nostalgia and something that you've kind of played on you know obviously the great british menu and stuff like that kind of um yeah, well, I mean, as we talked about before, nostalgic is eating is yeah. only memories. You know, it's only memories. If you have an ice cream, you will not a vanilla ice cream, very simple. If you have a vanilla ice cream, you know if it's a good vanilla ice cream or a bad vanilla ice cream. Yeah. Because you are, from your last experience eating it, you are now judging it on your last experience. Oh, this is oh, this is horrible. This is a terrible one. The best I had one was in Cleethorpes with a flake in it, and, and that was my best one because also where you were, who you were with. I was on Cleethorpes. I was walking the dog. It's a beautiful sunny day. This makes this ice cream taste better. Yeah. School foods. You know, if you if you had a good experience at school and you were eating the school dinners and you you had fond memories of it, suddenly that memories of having that gravy in the chips just is 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 extenuated. Yeah. You know. Um, Eating, you know, my grandmother's uh, Sunday roast and her watching us eat it with great pride and she made the best lamb and Yorkshire puddings and things like that. It's a memory. You know, when I think of tacos now, guacamole, I promise you, I'll be thinking of Mexico and the fond memories I had in Mexico, you know. And so food is only a memory. So if you can... If you can, you know, you say, you know, just like, you know, clothes on as well. You go, oh, I remember, or haircuts. Oh, I remember haircuts used to be like this from the 60s or whatever. And you, you can look at a photo of someone. You can go, no, that's from the 60s. Look at the sideburns and this. Um, if you look at a plate of food, a prawn cocktail, oh, that's very 70s, you know, because it was the thing then. But it's about where you were when you had that prawn cocktail. Who were you with? Maybe it's a bad experience. Oh, I remember throwing my guts up when I had an oyster. Oh, I had one and, and I, I got food poisoning, so I'm never going to have one again. So it, it can work, you know, on the, on the flip side of that. But as a cook, it's very interesting that you have the power to play on people's nostalgic or memory emotions uh, by introducing familiar dishes and flavours. That's, that's power. That's awesome, yeah. So Rule what's... The world. <laughs> <laughs> what's... Um, What's next in your chapter for with with the recipe side of things? So like the recipe again. Um, the next chapter in the recipe is I think I will um, charter her, give other people the opportunity to experience what I've experienced. Not that we're going to travel and cross oceans, but I reckon there's plenty of people out there who want to take a slice of what I what I've done and and, and and do it. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna offer people the, the opportunity for me to cook for them. We've got the Mission Star Chef cooking for you on board for one week and uh, I'm gonna do gastronomic foods, barbecues, street food as well. So it's not just like super fine dining, but you know, having this kebab on a beach that I've done for you, watching the sunset, having a cocktail that I learned how to make in Mexico having uh, the guacamole or tacos that I've learned here or the Cuban li- Cuba Libras that I learned in Cuba. All of this will be squeezed into one week that I want to invite guests on board um, to visit Antigua where the boat will be 
uh, based to see the beautiful beaches, the sunsets, um, the smells of the tropical flowers, and just give them that 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 slice of life for a week. Uh, and I think that is what's going to make me really um, proud of the journey that we've done. That I can offer people that again. Uh, I want them to go put the cutlery down. I want them to 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 think this is the best week I've ever had. Spending a week with Colin and Bex on his boat, him looking after us, mm. and using his two years experience on this, it's just I think it's going to be great. Uh, but then it means it gives me the free time to come back to the UK and 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 spend a lot more time focusing on wintering and fields and and just keep polishing it because wintering and fields is a machine that just needs to be polished, 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 and see how far we get. Cool. Yeah. yeah, I think that's nice. amazing. Yeah, like, the progression from yeah um, telling us, you know, when you first sailed the Atlantic to now, you're at the point where you you're kind of you know sharing your experience, hard yeah. earned experience. Yeah, yeah, with, yeah, yeah. With, So other people can. Enjoy. It's been nice, kind of just hearing, because obviously people sometimes look at people who own businesses and something and go, oh, it's been easy to get to where they're at, but actually... Yeah, oh, look at him, see, the Caribbean yeah, on his yacht, yeah, oh, he's doing yeah. well. They don't you see know. the actual backstory of people <laughs> yeah. struggling to, you know, yeah. like buying a dog with your last kind of 200. Yeah, I mean, I don't think there's many people who had realised that you're so skint that, yeah. you know, you're asking yourself whether the bank's going to take the dog off you or not, you know, and so um, I think that just shows the character of, 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 of what I was like when I was at that age. I mean, I was, I was 24 at the time, and I had no, there was no investor to help me. There was no one I could knock on the door and say, look, I'm in a bit of financial trouble here. Who do I speak to? Where do I go? It's just you and, and the world, and that's it. Um, that's why I wanted to be a lot more supportive with the guys who work for me now, that if, if Gaz or Xavier want to develop further, they can come to me and say, oh, how do I do this? What do I do here? Um, unlike like me, I didn't have anyone like yeah, that. Yeah. So um, it's good for me to be there, um, support financially or just um, emotionally and, and in many other ways. Thank you very much. Colin. It's been a pleasure having you in the studio after good. all this time. Yeah. Cool.